the, the portion for us this morning and I trust that it's going to be staying on on your mind. It's going to be staying on your mind as he has read it. Um, amen. I think it's time for Sunday school. Those who are going to Sunday school can, can go there. Those who are supposed to be there can go there. And those who are here can then uh, stay. Amen. Let me just read the portion in chapter 2. I'll just read the portion in chapter 2, verse 1 to 5. And then we'll get into our message for this morning. And so, we are, we were talking just before we, we I promise we'll get into the Ephesians series uh, eventually. Um, we'll get into the Ephesians series. Um, but this morning we want to just talk about who we are. If you, look, if, you look, if you look to your right, if you look to your right, um, we have our values as a church that we've put up. We have what we believe we stand for and what we are. So there might be a lot of people. Every year we like to start with two things. We like to start with prayer, January, and we like to talk about who we are. We like to talk about our values so that we, we may introduce them so that you may understand who we are as a church. And this morning, I want to talk about um, our, first, our first value. I want to talk about our first value. If you look at the, the first one, it says we preach the gospel. <clears throat> we preach the gospel, right? And so the way that I will double-click on that, I, I, want, to, I want to double-click on what it means to preach the gospel. The way that I will put it, we value truth over experience. That's how I will put it. We value truth. Over experience, and that's 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 how we'll explain it uh, here uh, this morning. And so, and so the question is, what is our DNA as the church in Mamelodi? Who are we? Maybe you've been coming, maybe you've been kind of checking us out, but you kind of notice some things about us, but you actually can't figure out who are these people. Like, what 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 are they? What do they believe? What are they about? Right? Who are they? Um, I like to know people behind the scenes. I like to take time to know who are people, what makes people tick. I'm always checking out the behind the scenes and the reasons why people do what they do. I'm not interested to know the light camera action. I want to know why people do what they do. And I believe you might also have that desire to know why and who are we as the church in Mamilori. To put it another way, what is our DNA? What is our DNA? Maybe you can ask yourself, what is a DNA? What is a DNA? A DNA in your body is responsible for coding information that tells your genes the kind of person that's going to make you to be you. Let me say that again. Your DNA, it's a coding information that tells your genes what to do in making you to be you. And so the color of your eyes, right? We don't all have the same color of our eyes, right? The color of your hair, where you are male or female, whether you are tall or short, blue eyes, brown eyes, basically what makes you to be you. The DNA is responsible for coding that. Your DNA, your unique DNA is responsible for transmitting information to your genes that will make you unique. That will make you you to be you. Nobody has the same fingerprints as you. Did you know that? Nobody has the same voice as you, right? Nobody thinks exactly like you think. There's something that God has created that makes you to be you. Well, at TCM, we also have our DNA, right? We have what makes us to be us. We have culture. You can call it a culture. We have a culture. Like the human body, we may share same things with other people. We all have the same nose. We all have the same head. We all have the same feet. But as you look at the specifics, you can tell for normal. As much as we have the same eyes, but no one eye is the same as the other eye, right? There's a sense in which every church should be the same, right? They should be the same. We should be the same in preaching what uh, we're supposed to preach. We should all preach the gospel. We should all make disciples according to what the Bible says we should do. But there's another sense in which as you become specific, um, like specific color, um, and the color of your eyes and the color of your, your hair, any given church, 
will be a bit different from another church in that sense. Amen. But I'll explain as we go. So question this morning is, what is TCM's DNA? What is TCM culture? And why is it that it is that way? I have a what and I have a why question. What is it? What is it? What is it that is our DNA? What is our culture? And why do we have it the way that it is? I'm going to get to my text later on. But allow me for a few minutes to talk about the what. Allow me to talk about the what to our values. Firstly, we value truth over experience. We value truth over experience. If you were to press me on what we mean by when we say we preach the gospel, I was going to say to you, you know what we mean by that? We value truth over experience. We value truth over experience. Part of what makes us who we are is that we value the truth of the gospel over personal experience. One of the things you will notice about us is that we're very serious about the gospel. We're very serious about the gospel. We don't just say, we don't just put it out there that we preach the gospel, but the gospel is the very thing that permeates the, every aspect of our way of doing life more again. Amen. The gospel as in revealed in the person of Jesus Christ and the gospel as it is revealed through the word of God. Amen. Now when I say we value truth over experience, I'm not necessarily bashing experience. Please don't get me wrong. Experience is important. Hallelujah. For you to be saved, you need an experience with Jesus Christ. Amen. You need an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus needs to save you. Jesus needs to do something in your life where you will be changed. Right? So there's nothing wrong with, with experience. But what we mean by we value truth over experience, we mean Hori, experience is not the end in itself, but it's a servant of the truth. Let me say that again. Experience is not an end in itself, but experience is not really a servant the truth. I will explain what we mean by that. Before we can talk about any of our experiences, we must first talk about truth. Amen. What is true? Not how do we understand truth, not how do we interpret truth, not how do we engage truth, but the question is, what is truth? What is actually true? As we interrogate that question, Bazalan, we come to the conclusion that there is a God, hallelujah, that is true. Amen. There is a God. He has revealed himself in the person of Jesus Christ and his word. Amen. Amen. And thirdly, we must give an account to him as to how we respond to him. Amen. Those are the things which are true. So when we say we're in truth over experience or that we gospel centered, we mean we don't get to decide how church must be done. We don't get to decide how we want to do things the way we want to do things. There is someone out there more smarter than us who has told us how to conduct ourselves in the church. Amen. He has the authority who determine what is the truth. He has the authority to determine what is right and what is wrong. And I want to demonstrate this value by using two areas. I'm still on the words. I'm coming to the text. The area of preaching and the area of our personal life. The value of the fact that we value truth over experiences demonstrated in our preaching. God chose to spread his message, his, his message not by writing letters on the sky. God chose his, to spread his gospel not by sending an angel to come maybe and eloquently speak it. But it's a funny thing that God chose to use preaching as the way the, the gospel is going to spread. Amen. That's how we chose to change people. It's through the foolishness Amen. of preaching. Amen. Amen. Using little sinful, weak people like us to preach his perfect gospel and somehow he's pleased to change people as we do that. We don't understand it. We don't know why he does it, but that's how he's chosen to do it. Amen. First Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 2 to 5, when Paul is getting ready to go and preach the gospel, in Thessalonica, when Paul is getting ready to tell the people the message has given him, 
It's interesting that he goes there and guess what he does? He preaches the gospel. He doesn't go there to give them their, his own opinion. He goes there believing that there is this message called the gospel. There is this truth called the gospel that he needs to tell people. And as he speaks, people are going to be changed. First Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 2 to 5. He says verse 2, we give thanks to God always for you all. Making mention of you in our prayers. Constantly bearing in mind the work of faith and the labor of love. And the steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. In the presence of our God and Father, knowing brethren, His choice of you. Look at verse 5. For our what? Our what? Gospel. Our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit with full conviction, just as you know what kind of men we prove to be for your sake. He says our what? Gospel. Our gospel did not come to you. Amen. So he had a belief. He had a conviction that when he goes to an area, he needs to preach the what? He needs to preach this message called the gospel. Paul says, when I come to Thessalonica, I'm not going to tell them about my credentials. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to boast about me. I'm going to tell them the gospel. Amen. And you see what the gospel does in chapter 1. He says here, verse 6, You became imitators of us and the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all believers. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place you fell to what God has gone forth, so that we have nothing to say to you. For they themselves report what kind of a reception we had with you, how you turned to God from idols, to serve the living God and wait for his son from heaven. Hallelujah. Paul says, when I came, I preached this message, this foolish message of the gospel, and somehow people began to change. The gospel began to change people. Hallelujah. He did not talk about himself. He presented the gospel. He presented to them this message about Jesus' death and resurrection, and he's coming back. He told them about how to be reconciled to God. He presented Jesus to the Thessalonians. At TCM, we are founded on the truth of the gospel. Without the gospel, all we have here is a social club. We say that again. Without gospel as the center in this church, all we have here is society. Fair. Amen. TCM would not exist if there was no gospel. It's actually the very reason we exist. That's how important it is. The gospel is the message that Peter preached at Pentecost. When everybody began to come and, 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 and people were saying that he was drunk, Peter stands up. He doesn't preach his experience. He's been with Jesus. He doesn't talk about that. He preaches the gospel. He tells them of their need to repent. He tells them how that the same Jesus that they crucified is the same Jesus that has now risen again. That's the message that Peter preached. The gospel is, is the message that Paul preached when he stood with the philosophers in Acts chapter 17 at Mars Hill. Amen. He told them about the gospel. He didn't suddenly change his message because he was dealing with very smart people. He told them the gospel. We value the truth of the gospel over personal experience. This is the message that Paul preached everywhere. He was consumed with the message of the life, death, resurrection of Jesus. Another place where this value of truth of experience is seen is in our personal lives. Is in our personal lives. Romans chapter 15 verse 1 to 3. Paul says something interesting. Romans 15 verse 1 to 3. He says, We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak. And not what? Not what? Right. Says we, and it says we is talking about believers. Says we are strong. We have an obligation to deal with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, right? To build him up for Christ. Yes, yes, the gospel. Why? For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, 
the reproaches of those who reproach you fell on me. Paul says when we as believers get together, guess what? Our personal life is built on the foundation of the gospel. We are not to please ourselves. In other words, we must value the truth of the gospel even over ourselves. Even when you personally want to act in a way that is contrary to, God, to the gospel, Paul says, don't please yourself. Please the other person. Do things for the good of the other person. Amen. And he illustrates this in the previous chapter in Romans chapter 14, where the people were fighting, or not fighting, but they were disagreeing about food sacrificed to idols, right? So there was this disagreement in Corinth where people used to be Gentiles, used to sacrifice things to idols. Amen. We as Africans understand that, right? People used to sacrifice things to idols. They come and get saved and you have other people that now are beginning to partake and eat of the very things that those people used to sacrifice idols to. And so now we are going to get this tension now. When are you are, how can you eat that thing if you call yourself a Christian? And so Paul has to come and address it. No, Bazalwan, we all know it's not about food, right? Food doesn't make one to be saved. Food doesn't make one to be saved. But for the sake of your brother, don't do anything that will be a stumbling block to them. Amen. Amen. Again, showing the fact for it, the truth of the gospel must bear into how we live as a church. We have to please Christ over pleasing ourselves. The church is a place where you must be equipped and kept accountable to do God's will. Let me say that again. The church is the place where you must come and be kept accountable on doing God's will. Why? Because it's all about the gospel. It's not about us. It's all about doing what God wants. God is there. He has spoken. He has expectation of how he wants his children to live. And our desire is to please him. Amen. It's unfortunate that church has become a place where people's selfish desires are promised to be realized. Amen. Where people come and the refrain in the chorus is, don't talk to me about my personal life. Don't tell me about repentance. Don't tell me about sin. Tell me about how God wants to bless me. Tell me about how, how, how all these material things God wants to give me. And as soon as you speak to people about keeping them accountable to the gospel, what God says, guess what? They leave. They leave and go to the place where they don't have to please other people, but please themselves. So what we're saying is that TCM, when we say we value truth over experience, we value in preaching, but we value it over your personal life. We want you to please God. We want to keep you accountable in your walk with God. We're not going to leave you if you're not walking right with God. Amen. As soon as you are part of this body, you are saying to us, guys, I'm a Christian. I recognize that I'm a sinner and I want to be kept accountable in terms of my walk with God. You, you need to realize that's what you're saying, right? When you become part of this. If you say, nah, nah, give to me, I don't want that. Just leave me alone. I just want to worship God. Then you're at the wrong place. That's not the church. That's not the gospel. The gospel has implication for your personal life. Amen. Amen. It has implications for how you live, how you talk, how you behave. The gospel gets everywhere. And it is the church's responsibility to make sure that we keep each other in the right way. I know the one being meant to that. Amen. Amen. Because we love being told about how, how amazing things and how God is going to do amazing things. But when we come into your life and say, hey, brother, have you checked that pride? Have you checked that sin in your life? How are you doing on that? Yeah, no, then we don't want to hear about that. But when we say we are gospel centered, I need you to realize that the gospel is going to be the foundation. We're going to call you back always to the gospel. We're going to call you back and say, 
He died for this, right? Let's get back to the gospel. That's the what. Amen. Now let's come to our text. The why. Somebody says, Maramurutu, why? 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 Why are you so hard? Why? Why are you? Why are you so mona and then have a good time? Kitsamai and then do what I want. Give a shot. Why? So, here's our text. Number one. We did not invent the truth of the gospel. We did not what? We didn't come up this thing at the gospel. Now I'm in the text now. Go to chapter 2 verse 1. First Corinthians chapter 2 verse 1. That's where we're going to be in our time. Are you there? First Corinthians 2 verse 1. My points will be coming out from this text. We've talked about the what of the gospel. But now let's talk about the why of it. Why is it that the gospel is a big deal? I think this text is going to answer that very beautifully. He says here, When I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or wisdom, proclaiming to you the what? Chapter 2, verse 1, proclaiming, pro proclaiming to you the? The testimony of God. The testimony of of God. Let's talk about Corinth. Paul is writing to the church in Corinth. This was a church that had many problems. They used to argue amongst themselves about who's the greatest preacher. They used to have a lot of preachers. Look at again. So a big thing as Paul has planted the churches away, oh or no. But too bad they're busy arguing about Horkiman or Rabest and all of that. Says, let me write a letter. Let me write something to fix that. Look at chapter 10. Now, chapter 1, verse 10. Now, I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus, that you all agree that there be no divisions among you, but that you be made complete in the same mind, in the same judgment. For I have been informed concerning you, my brethren, by close people, that there are quarrels among you. So, oh, no, or no. There's quarrels among these people. One person says, I'm of Apollos. Another one says, I'm of Paul. Another one says, I'm of Cephas. Another one says I'm of Christ. Another one says I'm of Archbishop. Another one says I'm of what one. He's hearing all of that. He says, let me write a letter to them. So in answering them, you see his maturity. He doesn't answer them by elevating himself. I know. Everyone knows for now I'm better than Paul or Peter. It's me you should be focusing on. Paul does not give himself titles like Major One, Archbishop, Dr. Paul. He, he doesn't elevate himself when he's dealing with this problem of division. Holy guys, you know, I saw Jesus from heaven. They didn't see him. So I'm the best preacher. Instead, he focuses the church on the person of Christ, the truth of who Christ is. Look at verse 13, chapter 1. Has Christ been divided? Eh? Let divide us all. Has Christ been divided now? Paul was not crucified for you, was he? Huh? I didn't die for you. Were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God I baptized none of you except Christmas and Gaia so that no one would say I was baptized in my name. Now I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't know whether I have baptized anyone. For Christ did not send me to baptize but to preach the word. The gospel not in cleverness of speech so that the cross of Christ would not be made void. This is a man in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 who tells us he's been to the third heaven and back. This is a man who was used more than Peter, more than Apollos to bring about and write two thirds of the New Testament. This is a man who has been used mightily of God. If anyone had to brag about who's better, it was the Apostle Paul. But instead of Paul doing that, he does what every pastor must do. He refocuses their attention not on himself but on Christ. Then he says in verse 17, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not in cleverness of speech, so that the cross would not be made void. Paul, Paul said, I didn't wake up one day and say I'm going to preach Christ. We read the story of Paul, right? When we started the service. You saw how he was called. He says he was sent. He says Christ sent me with the message. He sent me to preach about the crucified Jesus. This message is that I'm not to talk about myself, but I'm to talk about Christ. God wants to receive glory for himself. He doesn't share this glory with other people. 
So God designed the message in such a way that it brings down man and it lifts up Christ. He designed it in such a way that it looks foolish. It looks foolish that you would have to actually be changed by God to actually believe it. That's how foolish it is. See, if it was a message that was invented by Paul, then Paul would have elevated human wisdom and human values. But because it is God, this message is not convincing for many. He continues verse 18, For the word of the cross is foolishness. Kumbo read that for us. And so Paul is showing here things to reveal why he's not impressed with why the church in Corinth is busy comparing Corinth, this one is better than this. He says, hey, where's the wise man? Where's the scribe? Where's the debate of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world, right? You guys making a big deal about who's a better preacher. Why? Come on, guys. God made the wisdom of the world to be foolish. So in our text, he says, when I came to you, I didn't come with security of speech proclaiming the testimony of God. The testimony of God. Notice what he calls it in 1B. He calls it the message he was preaching. He calls it the testimony of God, right? He uses the other words in verse 18. Look at verse 18. Look at the word he uses. For the word of the cross. This is the same concept. He calls it the testimony of God. Verse 18, he calls it the what? The word of the cross. Verse 17, he calls it the gospel, right? For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the and the cross of Christ. But in 2 verse 1, he calls it the testimony of God. Every time that the apostle preached, he was bringing God's own testimony. When a man of God opens the Bible and is preaching, he's not bringing ordinary news. He's not doing a political speech. He's not reading from Daily Sun. He's not reading from a magazine. He's bringing God's own testimony. Modimoli and honorary testimony. Amen. We talk about testifying and testimonies in the church. Well, God also has a testimony. What is the testimony? Look at verse 2. For I determined to know nothing among you except who? Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Paul says, if you want to know the testimony of God, look at Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the explanation to us. When God wants to explain himself to us, he comes in the person of Jesus. Apart from Christ, we cannot know God. When God was getting ready to connect with us, he sent Jesus to explain himself to us. In our wisdom, in our mind, we could not know God. It had to take God to reveal himself to us. Chapter 1, verse 18, John says, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. So Jesus is God's best explanation. If you want to know who God is, look at Jesus. Any message that does not recognize Jesus as God's testimony is a false gospel. If anybody preaches anything else, apart from a Jesus who was the Son of God, who was crucified for us, that person is not preaching the true gospel. Paul says verse 2, For I determined... Do we have another word? Another version? Verse 2, for I determined, is another word. For I, I made a, I made a what? I made a decision. Another one? I made up my mind that there's an intentionality here. Paul was a very educated man. He could have preached a lot of things to the Corinthians, but he told himself, I am going to preach Jesus and him crucified. Why do we value truth over experience? It is because we didn't come up. We didn't invent this message of the cross. The message of the cross is God's message. We can't believe Abba Fundi so all the smart people got together and said, guys, we need to change the world. Corona is happening, everything. What message can we get to the world that will make us believe in? Oh, let's come up. Maybe if that happened, then maybe, but that's not what happened. We didn't invent the message of the cross. We didn't dream up a savior who was going to save the world by dying, right? We didn't create a Jesus the way the Bible presents him. We were entrusted with this message of a crucified Christ. This message about this Jesus who came from heaven 
lived 33 years in this world without sin. And when Jesus told us about his father, we didn't accept him, but we killed him. But instead of rejecting us, he rose after three days. And now he's inviting everyone to fellowship with himself. He comes back not to condemn us, but to show us who God is. This Jesus is not like any other savior we could have imagined or come up with. We thought he will come like Ushagazum. We thought that he will come and conquer his kingdom. But that's not how he came. He comes as a lamb, right? He comes as a lamb and dies for people that reject him. Who dreams up there? Who comes up? Like, you know, when I, in my worst moments, when I doubt and I think about Christianity, I'm like, but there's no way. If we came up with that message, we would be the heroes. We, we would be the heroes. Who writes the Bible? And even these people that wrote the Bible, they show their weaknesses. They show how they are failing. Who does that? When we write things, we write it so that we can show ourselves as great. But the message of the gospel is different. And that's what tells you that it's from God. Because it happens to everybody. Every one of us, it tells us we are a sinner. It tells you that you are not good enough. It tells you that you need a savior. It tells you that help must come from somewhere. Amen. Only God could have dreamt that. Only God could have written that message. Paul says, I determined, I determined, I, I made a reservation. I told myself that when I go to the Corinthians, I will preach Jesus and him crucified. Paul did not preach Jesus the economist. Paul did not preach Jesus the economist. Paul did not preach Jesus the motivational speaker. Uh, there's people that preach Jesus the motivational speaker. It's all about wrapping you up and making you feel good. Paul did not preach Jesus the politician. Paul did not preach Jesus the social worker. Even when social work is very important. But that's not the message he preached. He preached Jesus the crucified. Woo to me, he says, if I preach anything else except the gospel. Why do we value truth? Because we did not invent the truth of the gospel. It's a message that comes from God. Is he okay? All right. Let's just wait until it gets help. Paul preached Jesus the crucified. This is our DNA as the church. We have had people come over the years that want to make their personal experience and their subjective personal experience what they think should be the main thing. They want to make that the main thing in the church. And we've stood and we said that's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Because we refuse to allow the spotlight to fall on anyone else except Jesus. We refuse to make any other thing the main thing except the cross and the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's our value. We value truth over experience. Why? Because we didn't invent this gospel. We didn't invent this message. Lastly, why do we value truth over experience? Verse 2. Verse 3 to 5. He says, I was with you. He says, For I determined to know nothing except Jesus crucified. For I was with you in weakness, in fear, and much trembling. My message, my preaching, were not with persuasive words of wisdom, but in what? In demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith would not rest on what? On the wisdom of men, but where? That's powerful. I, I, Paul says I was intentional coming to you because I didn't want you guys to make a big deal about me. I didn't use persuasive words. I didn't, I didn't talk like the Greeks. You all are Greeks. You like people that are philosophers, that philosophers about this. I intentionally came in demonstration of power so that I may preach Jesus crucified. 
So that when you guys get saved, you can know that it was God who did it. And it was in me. city of Corinth was affected by the Greeks. The Greeks worshipped things that were smart. They, they liked smart things, the Greeks. Those of you who, who studied metric and um, you're probably using a lot of the things that Greeks created that you don't even know. Did you know that a thermometer was created by the Greeks? Thermometer. Coins, locks. Olympics. As we have, were created by Greeks. Wheelbarrow, maps, alarm, automatic doors. Democracy. The concept and system that we worship so much. It wasn't always like this. People used to have monarchies. They used to have kings and subjects. It wasn't always this way. Democracy was invented by the Greeks. They produced philosophers such as Socrates, such as Plato, such as Aristotle. So humanly speaking, when you're supposed to go and speak to Greeks, and um, you must know your things. Eh? Yeah, you can't. You're supposed to have yeah, a PhD when you go and talk to the Greeks. You're supposed to know your stuff. If you can't talk to them about these things, they will challenge you seriously and think you're foolish. They like smart things. And so you can imagine Paul when he now getting ready to preach to these people. So Paul was a Jew. Can be very intimidating, right? I have to speak to these people now. Let me think. What, what philosophers, what, what smart things can I say? You understand him here now. Why he says what he says. Let's look at it. Verse 3. I was with you in what? In weakness, right? Right? I wasn't afraid to be weak. Paul says, I was with you in weakness. I was with you in fear and much trembling. I was afraid. And my message and my preaching were not in what? Persuasive words of wisdom. He's saying that because why eat it? Because that's what they like. But in demonstration of power, so that your faith doesn't rest on men, but on the power of God. Paul says, I was intentional in preaching to you, Corinthians. I didn't intentionally preach the way Greeks preach. I don't preach to impress with eloquence or nice ideas. Paul came knowing the concept of the cross, the concept of somebody rising from the dead was foolishness to them. Like you are stupid in the Greeks. You tell them about somebody rising from the dead. That is the most foolish thing you can say to them. Look at chapter 1 verse 22. Now you'll begin to understand chapter 1. He says, for indeed Jews ask for what? And Greeks search for what? But we preach who? A Jews, a stumbling block to Gentiles, what? Foolishness. But to those who have been called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Paul understands that the gospel is not going to be accepted by everybody. He goes into a city knowing that there will be many people who think it's going to be foolishness. There will be many that will see it as a stumbling block. But at the same time, this is why TCM is here. There will be many that see wisdom. Amen. To people it will be foolishness. Already. These guys are stupid. Always going to church. Always carrying a Bible. And trying to this white Jesus and all of that. But for some, they will see it as like, that's it. This is what I've been looking for. This is what I've been wanting in my life. And that's why we're here. Amen. We're excited about people encountering Jesus and saying, that's the wisdom I've been looking for. So that your faith will not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. If Paul came to the Corinthians, knowing which available tanda in Taranipo, he could have changed his message to try and please them so that he doesn't look foolish. The people would have put their faith in Paul and not God. He had done that. That's why he says, I was with you in weakness. He says, there was nothing special about me. Theologians say that Paul had a physical infirmity. He wasn't really a great speaker. He wasn't really somebody who was really great writer, but not so much of a great speaker. We cannot confirm that. 
He says, I came in demonstration of spirit and power. That is, God used me through preaching and miracles given to the apostles so that the people focus on God and not on Paul. Amen. Amen. And that tells us the purpose of miracles. Miracles and the supernatural is not supposed to lead people to the preacher. They're supposed to be leading people to God. Let me say that again. Miracles and the supernatural are not supposed to put the spotlight on the preacher. They're supposed to put the spotlight on Christ. Paul was jealous that people don't worship him. That he says, even in his style of preaching, he came trembling and in fear so that people would not think much of him. He was reading. There's a serious problem when people start to worship man and not Jesus Christ. Do you think Paul would have been happy with people taking photos and putting stickers at the back of their cars? Do you think Paul would have been happy seeing holy water oil bracelets making money out of it? Do you see the Apostle Paul doing that? Quick illustration, Acts chapter 14. Look at how the Apostles reacted when people wanted to worship them. Quick one. Acts 14 verse 8 to 18. I want you to look at what they do when people worship them because of their gifts. Acts 14 verses 8 to 18. And so at least there was a man sitting who had no strength in his feet, lay from his mother's womb, who had never walked. This man was listening to Paul as he spoke, who when he had fixed his gaze on him, had seen that he had faith to be made well, and said with a loud voice, Stand up with your feet. He leaped, began to walk. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, are you with me? Yes. Verse 11. When the crowd saw Paul raise somebody who fell down, and he says, stand upright. Look at what they did. They raised their voice saying in the Laconish language, the gods have come like men and have come down to us. Major one is here. <laughs> they began calling Barnabas Zeus. They began calling Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. Put a Baba Fadi title over the priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought oxen and gallons to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifices with the crowd. Oh, look at verse 14. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, what did they do? They tore their robes, rushed out into the crowd and said, Men, why are you doing this? We are also men of the what? Same nature as you and we preach the word. We preach the gospel to you that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. And they begin to preach the gospel to them. Amen. Amen. Every time in the book of Acts, when miracles are done, they say, hey guys, it's not about us. Hey, Jesus, he's the one that's making us do this. It's not us. They preach repentance and faith. They preach Jesus and Him crucified. Why is it that we value truth over experience? One, we did not invent the truth of the gospel. Secondly, our gifts, our talents can never save anybody. Amen. The only thing that saves is the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ's death and resurrection. Paul says, for I'm not ashamed, right? Chapter 1 verse 16 of the gospel. For it is the power of God. What is the power? The gospel. Amen. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The gospel, the wisdom of God is the only one that can save man. It's enough for the Jew who thinks because he was chosen by God, he has really access to him. It's enough for the Greek who worships intellect and wisdom. It's enough for everybody. It's enough for the African who worships ancestors. The gospel is enough for all of us. We don't need another gospel. The one that we have is enough to say. We don't need an upgrade, Bazalwan. Amen. Amen. We don't need a new edition. 
is of your college school. Every textbook has an edition every year. Amen. This one has never needed to be edited because God has never made a mistake. He's never had to revise his thoughts. Why do we value truth of our experience? We didn't come up with the truth. Our own experience cannot save everybody. We didn't come up with this. And we are limited as men. We can't save everybody. Amen. It's the first value at TCM. We are gospel centered. What do we mean? We value truth of our experience. You will find that about us. We'll always ask, what does the Bible say? Amen. Amen. What does Jesus say? We, we, we're not, I have my ideas. I can give you what I think, but who cares? <laughs> who cares what I think? Who cares what you think? We care what God thinks, right? And if you come to us and we say, but before this, you guys are not doing according to the, uh, we listen. Uh, we have time for anybody who says, the Bible says, do this, you're not doing it. But if you come and you say, hey, yeah, ish. yeah, I had a dream and uh, I saw this and now we must try. Okay, it's your experience. You have a dream, I have a dream. What do we do with that? Amen. We can't do anything with your experience. It's you. All I can say is good for you. Dream more. I can't, we can't use that. We can't make serious gospel decisions because of personal experiences. Unless they line up with the word of God. Amen. They have to line up. As I say, experience is not a bad thing, but it has to be a servant of the truth. And it has to line up with what God is saying. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your gospel. Thank you that it's never changing. And I pray that you keep us as a church centered on the gospel. That will never change this value. That will keep on celebrating it. Um, that will keep on valuing you the gospel over everything else. We need the gospel more We need it to change us every day. We need it to change us personally as a church. And I pray that we'll continue to preach it faithfully and boldly. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.